Hey guys, it's lovely. So I was a little bored today, so I decided that I'd just kind of read something for you guys, like an audiobook, I suppose. So currently I'm reading um, Confessions of Son of Sam, and if you don't know who Son of Sam is, he's a serial killer, real name David Berkowitz, and uh, he did some killings in the 70s. Um, I don't really know how I got interested in him. I think I'm just, you know, interested in serial killers in general. And people know that. So, I'm reading up on him. It's very interesting. Um, I'm only on the 66th page. I think there's about, I don't know, 230. I only read slow now because of school. <laughs> if, if, if this was the past, I'd probably have finished this in two days. But this isn't the past. I have so much homework. But I was bored and I guess I'm procrastinating a bit. So I guess I'll just uh, read the fourth chapter for you since that's where I'm at. I'll just read the whole thing. It's fairly short. It, I think it's about maybe 14 pages. Yeah, or 20. <laughs> yeah, it's 20 pages. That's how long the chapter is. And I'm just going to read it for you unless it gets too long. Probably won't though, but... Yeah, I guess I just wanted to read it to you guys because it's interesting to me and maybe it's interesting to you. Like the time I did my first live stream ever, first live stream until I get a microphone. Because, yeah, I'm not doing that again. It was such shit. <laughs> but um, when I did my first live stream, it was on Charles Manson because I thought I have to expand my channel. It can't just be about feminism and social justice and how I hate it. It will also pertain to... uh serial killers and other things I'm interested in. But uh, yeah, it's a very interesting topic to me and I'd love to talk about it. So for now, I'm just going to read the freaking chapter. <laughs> and that is, once again, Confessions of Son of Sam by David Abrahamson. This is a fairly old book, but uh, very good. So let me begin. Chapter 4, Prologue to Murder. Search for Mother. Who was David Berkowitz? Really? Adopted children, without exception, have in their innermost soul strong fantasies about finding their real parents, the biological family to whom they can give their love, because being adopted is a circumstance not of their own making. They often withhold love from their adoptive parents. They are saving it for their true parents. Their love and allegiance are divided between the family that has adopted them and the real parents they have created in fantasy. Thus, ironically, adopted children frequently harbor hostility, as well as love if their upbringing is gratifying, toward the people who took them in. Such was David's case. His loyalty, like so many of his other emotions, was painfully split. In one of our first interviews, David said that he was about six or seven when Nat and Pearl told him he was adopted. Nat, however, told me that David learned about it before his third birthday. He was told that his mother had died in childbirth and that his real father was unable to take care of him, having told him once the Berkowitzes thereafter avoided the subject. David picked up their signal, and although the topic was always on his mind, he brought it up only when he was bothered. David recalled being confused and surprised by the information. His confusion was really centered, however, around the meaning of adoption and its consequences. No child likes to have a mother and father who are not of the same flesh and blood as he. He intuitively feels that something is wrong, but why talk about it? Thoughts can be annihilated with words. Hating being an, an adoptee, David looked more than once at Pearl and Nat and wondered what his natural parents looked like. What had he inherited from them? From whom had he gotten his secretiveness? His black hair? Who had bequeathed him his blue eyes? The situation obsessed him. Was he trying to figure out the interaction between heredity and environment? Between nature and nurture? Between original and after effects? Of course. He didn't use these terms. That David learned about his adoption before he was three is significant. If adopted children are told at an appropriate age, seven to nine years old, the majority of them assimilate the information about their origins and mature with few problems. But adopted children who have been told too early often feel shameful, anxious, and confused. 
They may show hate and rage, and often establish poor family relationships, and retreat into an intense fantasy life. Frequently, they are troubled and distrustful, with their intelligence disturbed. Why couldn't David belong to his adopted parents? The causes go back to earliest childhood. During the first three years of a child's life, mother and infant are merging in a unique symbiosis. The infant is dependent on her for the gratification of all his needs, physical and emotional. During the course of normal development, the symbiosis is then gradually attenu attenuated. During three stages of what Margaret Mahler has called separation individuation, during this time, the mother begins to cue, prompt, and encourage the child toward the formation of his own individuality and toward emotional separateness. Although still dependent on mother, the child, by the culmination of this process, should be able to sense himself as a separate individual. This reproachment period lasts from one and a half to two and a half years of age. What happened to David was that long before he was actually told he was adopted, he had already sensed it. Probably in part from unthinking exchanges between Nat and Pearl and his infant presence, this emotional shock prevented him from being able to rely on his mother to help him maintain his psychological balance during the critically sensitive time of emotional separation. As a result, the process was never properly completed, and mother and son failed to make the separation. This failure led to a lack of understanding, or alliance, between them and little or no ability on the part of the child to accept his parents. Separation anxiety became one of David's predominant emotions, which, in its wake, carried a deeply unresolved relationship between child and mother, the pull between them manifesting itself in their Oedipal relationship. All this unresolved conflict was to make the adult David intolerably vulnerable to the emotional problems normally encountered in the course of a life. How this showed itself will be clear if we recall young David's behavior with Pearl. While wanting to be on his own and asserting his independence, he was nonetheless extremely dependent on her. He was willful, obstinate, attention-seeking, and aggressive. Then, alternately, meek, clamoring for her good graces, desperately needful of her, and fearful that he would lose her. The foundation of his behavior was not love. It was anxiety, uncertainty, fear. Although unable to show genuine love, Berkowitz always feared losing it. This fear plus resentment at the dependency it caused engendered a constant anxiety that was never far from his conscious mind. At an age when he was unable to differentiate between fantasy and reality, he had learned of his adoption. Growing up with the two sets of parents, one fantasized, the other real, he lived in two different worlds simultaneously. This conflict provided the paradigm for the ambivalence that pervaded so much of his life. Much of the two-faced, hypocritical, manipulative aspects of his character were probably rooted in the situation. The lack of empathy between David and his adoptive parents was also of crucial importance. His response to Pearl's death was striking. I was happy and sad, he told me. Pearl was a pest. Sometimes she was nagging. He felt she had intruded on him, watching and spying on him. He felt he wasn't trusted. She knew nothing about him, his anger or his alienation, and he didn't understand how she could be so possessive of him. Overpowering his sense of self, there was little, if any, emotional understanding and responsiveness, little, if any, empathy between them. This lack of empathy was much of the foundation of narcissism, self-love, in David, who expected and demanded that everyone fulfill his wishes. Having no independent sense of self-love, he was seeking the self through the use and abuse of others for personal benefits, unable to establish any lasting relationship because he was unable to identify with others. He craved admiration and used his charm and seductiveness to mask his insensitive, insensitivity and cruelty. Because of the ambivalent relationship with his adoptive parents and the lack of family empathy, Berkowitz was not able to negotiate the rocky passage to adulthood. Yet in his fantasy, he clung with unusual tenacity and not abnormally to some hope of change in his life situation. We all need our fantasies to give us hope. If we lost them, something inside us will die, and David held on to his fantasy. But when, in December 1974, Nat Berkowitz announced that he planned to move to Florida, all David's old fears of abandonment, rarely far from the surface of his consciousness, were once again aroused. Now he was impelled to turn to the fantasy that had sustained him all his life. He would try to find his real family. I found a pamphlet about the Adoptees Liberty Movement Association, ALMA, an organization dedicated to helping adopt adopted children find their real parents, he told me, when I later asked him how he had traced his real mother. And then, 
I called them, got an application form, and paid the membership fee of twenty dollars. He paused and looked at me, leaning toward me. I had a deep desire to know my natural family, but, stressing every word, I had absolutely no knowledge of how I should search for my family. About a month later, I attended my first meeting in the auditorium. There were several hundred people. Later, we were divided into small groups, 12 to 20 people around a table. I didn't know anyone. I told them I would like to look up my natural father. Why not your natural mother? They asked. My mother, I said, had died at my birth. They laughed. What was so funny about that? I thought. Hadn't they heard of such a thing before? They then explained that they laugh because every adoptee is told the same story. Later on, I confronted my adoptive father about it, and he acknowledged the falseness of the story. He said she just couldn't take care of you. She was poorly off financially. Mother didn't really die. She just couldn't take care of me. Berkowitz had become quiet. He moved around on his chair, uneasy, pulling himself together as if aided by an unseen force. He slowly spoke. I always believed she had died. And I felt guilty, torn apart. I thought I was responsible for her death. As he spoke, he wrote down the words on a long yellow pad with a firm hand. He had become silent. I was waiting. Then, I always believed she had died. I felt guilty about it. I had that feeling constantly that I somehow caused her death. My life had been chosen and that somehow I was responsible for her death. Tears came to his eyes. He sat, self-absorbed, as if experiencing his enormous guilt for having caused his mother's death. Previously, at our very first interview, when he had described how he went about finding her, I had complimented him, but this time, when he responded to my praise with indifference, I began to suspect that finding his mother hadn't been everything he had fantasized it would be. A few days later, he wrote me, You see, Dr. Abrahamson, it was at this time, and never until that then, that I first realized I was an accident a mistake, never meant to be born, unwanted. I always believed my adoptive parents' story that my mother died while giving birth to me, and that my natural father put me up for adoption because he had no choice. He wasn't able to care for me without his wife. The previous story, while seemingly truthful, caused untold guilt for me during my childhood until age 22. It caused me guilt because I always believed that I had somehow been responsible for Betty Falco's death, but she wasn't really dead after all. David Berkowitz's feelings about the phony story are, to this day, typical of many of his feelings about his adoptive parents. I wasn't angry at the Berkowitzes for telling me the death story. They sincerely meant well. They were also told to say this, and after all, numerous other adoptees were told similar things. So as I said before, I wasn't angry with the Berkowitzes. The statement has the same quality as all his other statements about people who were central to his life. His denial of negative feelings may be consciously sincere, but the statements are not credible. The sudden disclosure of the truth about his real mother had the same effect as a lighted match on a powder keg. A desire to find her exploded within him. His need was immense and immediate. He embarked on a feverish, compulsive hunt. David, determined to find his roots, worked frantically, almost hysterically, during late 1974 and 1975 to reach his blood relatives. At last, he would even the score. At last, he would feel equal to all those people who had real parents. At last, he would feel emotionally secure. His search expressed his burning desire to make reality match fantasy, forgiving him up at birth more than anything he wanted to confront her with his outrage, to take her to task. He was aware of the hunt-like quality of his undertaking. There was something deeper than just searching for my natural family. I mean, there were hundreds of Alma members who were searching too. However, I don't think very many of them sought out their roots like I did. I had totally devoted myself to that hunt. It took everything out of me, and I worked around the clock. In my hunt, I divorced myself from all other cares except the basic ones. I neglected my studies and just spent my time running down leads and daydreaming what it would be like to see my natural family and what they looked like. Finding my mother was a necessity, an extreme one, that I cannot fully explain. Obviously, it was more than just locating her. It was much more. A copy of his David Berkowitz birth certificate gained him access to information at the Manhattan Bureau of Records. There, he discovered that his real name was Richard Falco. He called Nat in Florida, who said he didn't remember the name, but authorized David's uncle to go to the family safe deposit box, get the real birth certificate, and deliver it to David. At this point, he recalled that David had a half-sister and told him so. 
The birth certificate listed his parents as Betty and Tony Falco, his birthplace as Brooklyn, at last a real lead. David called all the Falcos in the current Brooklyn telephone directory, but did not find the one he sought. Discovering a Betty Falco in the Staten Island book, he drove to her house and rang her doorbell. She was not the right person, and she was not pleased to see him. In fact, she almost called the cops. An Alma counselor suggested to consult he consult the old phone books at the New York Public Library. The 1965 Brooklyn book listed a Betty Falco, but the listing appeared only for three more years. Following a hunch, he called information and asked for a Betty Falco at that address. He was told that the number was unlisted. Taking a chance, I went, he said, to the Brooklyn address with a Mother's Day card. I couldn't find her on the broken building directory, but I found the name Falco on a mailbox. On the card, he had written, You are my mother in a very special way. He signed it RF. Then, he goes on to say, I placed the letter which contained my telephone number in the mailbox. I still wasn't certain that this was the Falco I was looking for. I remember the tremendous lead in Staten Island, which suddenly dissolved. Several days later, the woman in whose mailbox I left the letter called me. After questioning her, I discovered she was the person I was searching for. When I interviewed Betty Falco, she confirmed that she had found a card in her mailbox the day after Mother's Day, May 12, 1975, signed RF. Not knowing who it was, she called her daughter, who at once guessed who it must be. That he signed the card with the initials RF and not his legal ones, the DB, may have been another indication of his divided loyalty and identity. When several days later she called him, she was surprised to feel that she could have recognized his voice. She became excited, almost hysterical with joy. Berkowitz could not fully grasp the reality of it all. Was he really finally going to meet his mother? He was to meet her at the apartment of Betty's daughter, Barbara. What if only Barbara was there? Suppose Betty didn't like him. What if it, What if he couldn't stand her? He couldn't back out now. What What should he tell Nat? That he made a mistake? He was going to meet his family. Should he kiss them? Hug them? Shake their hands? He had known too much fear, too much being alone, too much not knowing anyone he could call his own flesh and blood. He had suffered loneliness every day and every night, but now he was going to know the truth. Nervous and excited, he had no idea what was in store. With his wild imagination, he had created a whole new world for himself, and for this he cannot be blamed. We all try to create lives that are attuned to our needs and sensibilities, what we cannot have or fashion in reality we make up for in fantasy. This is what Berkowitz did too. Maybe, he thought, he should have been satisfied with what he had, but now, on the threshold of meeting his real mother and his sister, it was too late to turn back. The existence he had lived until now, he could hardly call it a life, had come to an end. This was another life, one rooted in reality. Berkowitz seesawed back and forth his casual statement that, by the end of the week, I was on my way to meet my natural family for the first time, was infinitely more simple than the actual experience was. In fact, he approached the momentous meeting with tumultuous feelings. This encounter was to be the culmination of his lifelong dream. In one of our early interviews, I had asked Berkowitz to de describe his real mother. He cast his eyes down as if afraid of what I might see in them. Then, at last, having thought of an answer, he looked up and burst out with a triumphant, hearty laugh. She is like a Jewish mother he went on. Average looking. When she was young, she was good looking. She used to be a professional dancer in the Ziegfeld Follies. This non-committal reply to the question had given me the, his, this basic information. The historic meeting with Betty Falco had been a crushing blow, an unbelievable disappointment. Later in a letter, he described the meeting in detail. I suppose I was fearful of being rejected, that I was the one that they wouldn't like. This didn't happen, however. Yes, I looked forward to meeting her. The first time I saw her was at my sister's house. This is where we had the first meeting. My sister's house was clean and simple looking. The furniture was middle class, with plastic covering on the sofa, and club chairs to extend their life to the fullest. My mother appeared to me to be a little on the heavy side, with her hair done but in disarray. In other words, she tried to do something with it, something cute and neat, but failed miserably. This was when I first met her. Lately, she was she has a better hairstyles. She was plain looking, and I was disappointed about this. She certainly wasn't as pretty as Pearl. Of course, Betty was nervous, but I was too. Her clothing was neat, and I could see that she had carefully manicured herself for the first meeting. Actually, she looked out of place and comical. Her dress was ill-suited to her. It was a low-cut dress that left the tops of her breast exposed, and exposed even more when she bent down. She also wore too much perfume. All in all, she was nervous, friendly, cordial, shy, but ordinary-looking. 
If I remember correctly, my mother greeted me with a kiss and hugged me shyly. It was nice get-together, friendly and amiable, but clumsy and awkward. The first thing she started to do was apologize for giving me away for adoption. She also commented on the way I looked and seemed pleased that I appeared healthy. We sat on the couch in Barbara's apartment for quite some time and talked casually. What went through his mind when he first saw her? His thoughts raced. He was here because she was his mother. She bore him. He grew inside her. She brought him into the world. How was it when he was born? Did he lie on her stomach? Did he get at her breast? It preyed on his mind when he learned that she had given him up for adoption while keeping Barbara. Angry feelings swelled up in him, but he talked to her son about herself. As a young bride, she and her husband, Tony Falco, her maiden name had been Rebecca Broder, had operated a fish store in the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn. Tony had left her after only a year. He ran off with another woman, the widow, the widow of the store's previous owner. After Falco left, he was never heard from again, but he took up with a man named Joseph Kleinman. Thirteen years later, in 1953, David was born. Berkowitz was staggered. Tony Falco was still on David's birth certificate as his father was not his father at all. Barbara, his half-sister, was the only child of her marriage to Tony Falco. What a hoax! Using the name Falco on his birth certificate when Kleinman, her lover, was his real father. Rejected on two accounts. Not only was he illegitimate, he got a fake name on his real birth certificate. He didn't even get his real father's name. Later, I asked him to tell me more about his initial reactions to his mother. His reply, For your question about my mother, no, it isn't the least bit painful to talk about her. I think my first reaction was one of disappointment. I don't know what I expected. I had fantasized a beautiful woman, but all I found was a totally ordinary person. There's nothing about her which stands out. She was a nervous and frightened little woman. I felt sorry for her, but she is a kind of and friendly person who has been savaged by a lifetime of extreme guilt. Everything she says and does has an apology at the end of it and at the beginning. She's a chronic apologizer. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I hear this over and over. Every letter she sends has an apology in it. I'm sorry for this, I'm sorry for that, etc. No, I wasn't shocked. I wasn't scared. I was disappointed. Despite the anticlimax of the meeting and the crushing news about his real father, David's finding his real mother was a considerable achievement. While there are no statistics showing how many adoptees succeed in finding their biological parents, we do know that their numbers are small, particularly because of the emotional and legal obstacles they encounter. Several states have stringent laws specifically designed to hinder such reunions, although the state of New York now encourages them. Berkowitz told me that many in his group had given up looking because it was too much work and took too much time. He was an exception. The single-mindedness of his purpose gave him strength and perseverance. His anticipation of meeting his mother had been overwhelming, and his disappointment when he saw her proportionately frustrating, but his disappointment had nothing to do with her physical appearance, nor did it have much to do with her personality. Berkowitz could not have been satisfied with any mother he found, no matter that she might look like Elizabeth Taylor and behave like Mother Teresa. The reason was simply that she had given him away, a matter which could not be forgiven, and to add insult to injury, it had been give done because he had been born illegitimately. Obviously, my adoption, as Berkowitz himself said in a classic understatement, caused me mental and emotional problems. His feelings of shame, guilt, and hopelessness about his origins turned into a saga of struggle and vanished hopes. I still to this day have negative feelings for my ma mom, Falco, despite her nice and friendly ways. I don't have it in me to totally forgive her. I told her when I first met her, and a great many times afterwards, that I forgave her, but this isn't really the case. I went through too much with this adoption business to simply say, all is forgiven, mom. I had so much agony over the thoughts that I somehow caused her death. So many years I believed the story about my mother's dying at birth. I believed that my father, whoever he was, gave me up for adoption because he couldn't handle me by himself. However, I believed that my father, my natural father, had nothing but hatred for me because the doctors let me live instead of her. Of course, I found out that this story wasn't true. My mom didn't die. It was all a hoax. Still, I lived with this guilt for me for so very long. I lived the story as if it were true. I mean, I retained this death guilt for so long. It's hard to get rid of it. And as I told you before, when I found out that Betty really didn't die, then I was relieved in one sense, but upset in another. Then the question came up as to why I was adopted. I had to find out. I had to find out someone from my real family. I needed family real bad. A mystical and perfect family. A blissful family. A perfect relationship. Of course, 
This wasn't to be. I guess this was one pathway that eventually led to murder. My dream family didn't exist. It was my last hope. I wanted to talk with David's mother, Betty, to hear about her reaction to her newly returned son and to learn firsthand what kind of a life she had had. Until Berkowitz was 22 years old in 1975, she had nothing to do with him except to give him life and deliver him to his adoptive parents. Still, it would be informative if I could learn what kind of people she and David's father, Joseph Kleinman, were. After long delays and with David's help, I was able to locate her on the phone. As we arranged for the interview, she sounded most friendly and anxious to talk to me. A few days later, in July 1980, she came to my office, about five feet tall, dressed in blouse and pants, nice face, blue eyes similar to those of her son. She confirmed what he had told me about her marriage with Tony Falco, her daughter Barbara, and that Tony had left her for another woman. As to her own background, her father was born in Austria-Hungary, and her mother in Poland. They had met in the United States, and Betty, one of nine brothers and sisters, was born in 1914. The family lived in Brooklyn. The father was a tailor who tried to do his best for the family. As the children grew up, they all had to go to work. Betty went through grade school, then went to work in factories and offices. Herman, her oldest brother, is still alive and lives in Florida. At 16, she became a chorus girl and danced in the Ziegfeld Follies. She was asked by Moish Florence Weiss to join the Jewish Theater on 2nd Avenue, but nothing came of this because her brother objected. A year later, she was again asked to join a theatrical troupe, but again, her oldest brother refused to give permission and she had to decline. In 1936, when she was 22, she was married in the Brooklyn City Hall to Tony Falco, whom she had known for two years. Her Jewish family was dead set against her marrying a Gentile. She had once had a marriage, the marriage certificate, she told me, but Tony took it with him when he left. Brooklyn District Attorney Eugene Gold later made a strenuous attempt to locate her marriage license, but it could not be found. When I mentioned this to Berkowitz, he said he thought it was because she had called herself a Falk, hence the misplaced license. Why then did she now call herself Falco, I wondered. Why has she never officially divorced Tony? Was she, in fact, ever really married to him? If she later tried to marry Kleinman, as she claims, she would have had to divor have a divorce. Her marriage seems a mystery. Indeed, much about Betty Falco seems a mystery, as David Berkowitz notes. My mother is a very secretive person who drowns herself in little white lies. She's always hiding something, and every time I ask a question, if for some reason she feels threatened by it, it gives me a stupid answer. She treats me like a child and a little baby. She'll write a two-page letter, yet she'd say nothing, like me. She's a sneak. Betty told me that when she became pregnant with Richard David, she had been living for quite some time with Kleinman. They had a good life, although he was married to someone else. He would stay with her in her apartment. She cooked for him and for his three children. He would spend the day with Betty and in the evenings would go back to his wife, where they slept in separate rooms. His children came to visit Betty and they all ate together. When her daughter, Barbara, married Kleinman, made a... Kleinman made a wedding for the girl. How did Betty feel when she got pregnant? I was happy about it. Kleinman seemed to like it, too. When I went into labor, he brought me to the Jewish hospital in Brooklyn, where I gave birth to a boy named Richard Falco on June 1st, 1953. He was a beautiful boy. Everyone said so. Dwelling on what it was like to have an illegitimate child, she said she was guilty and ashamed, and two days later, the child, through an intermediary, was given away. She felt terribly guilty, she said, about giving him away. As she spoke, her eyes began to glisten, tears began to fall, and she dried them with her handkerchief. Repeatedly, she asked, "'What could I do?' She looked miserable. Again and again, she brought up her son, whom she called Richard, and how bad she felt about his crimes and the young woman he had killed. After the baby had been taken away, I was in a fog. I didn't want to see anyone. I was depressed and upset. It was a tragedy for me. I felt guilty about it. Kleinman took me away for a couple of days so I could rest. When they returned, they again took up their life together. Asked why she gave away her child. She couldn't answer. I elaborated on my question. You told me that you and Kleinman had such a good relationship. Why then did you give your child up for adoption, a child who was an expression of the love between you? She looked at me, but said nothing. Either the good relationship with Kleinman wasn't true, or she herself lived in a fa fantasy world believing she was married to Kleinman. If she, she were depressed and upset, a tragedy for me, as she put it, why hadn't she used contraception or had an abortion? Without knowing the facts, it is not far-fetched to speculate that she may have wanted to have a child to force Kleinman to marry her, but her scheme failed. Apparently, he balked. What could she tell me about Kleinman? In contrast to her earlier reticence, she grew eager. He was very good-looking and very good with his hands. He was in real estate, among other things. He was brilliant. Their relationship was a makeshift one. She described him as a generous man who had money and gladly spent it on her so she could buy food and clothes and have something left over. 
David, however, felt quite differently about the man, his opinion apparently formed by talking with his mother and half-sister. He was stocky, about five-six tall, and weighing about two hundred pounds. He had a round oval head, similar to mine. He was stern-looking, never smiled, and was ugly. He always wore a hat, which just came down over his eyebrows, looking like a sinister character. I have nothing good to say about him. He was a liar. He was cheap, devious. He had a great deal of money, which he earned through real estate. He didn't leave my mother anything. They were shocked when they read his will. The will didn't have her name on it. She started to cry. He died in 1971. They had been together since 1950. But he told me about Kleinman's illness. At the end, he could hardly talk. He couldn't make himself understood. And when he did, I found out that he had not written a will, so I didn't get anything from him, except that his wife gave me the watch he had, which I had given him and a few other things we sat shiva a jewish ritual of mourning at her daughter's place and his sons came there clearly there was intimacy not only between betty and Kleiman, but also between betty and Kleiman's children and this relationship had continued for over twenty years but now she was alone again she said and began to lament her small apartment her radio and tv how lonely she was with no one to talk to however since the story about richard broke she had wanted to, to disappear to leave town forever hinting at her miserable financial situation she seemed defensive and was reluctant to mention anything that might harm herself or her family i reminded her that following our first phone conversation she had called me several times and asked many questions which i tried to answer i understood her precarious situation but this was something which had its roots in the past before she left my office she gave me her address the two interviews had lasted about three hours betty falco is intelligent she answers the questions in her own way, and, in this respect, she was she has much similarity to her son. Her story sounds like fiction. Her son David noted, but it's not. He describes Clement's funeral as it was told to him. When Joe died after a long illness at the funeral parlor, my mother and sister went, with all due respect, but sat in the rear of the funeral home. As I said, the relationship was known by everyone in the neighborhood, and by Clement's family. It was pretty open and perhaps scandalous, but it was accepted. By the way, my mother even mentioned to me that she and Joe's legal wife met face to face at the funeral home. However, nothing was said. This was also part of the arrangement. Of Kleiman's children, Berkowitz said, they loved Betty's kasha, a Jewish dish, and her split pea soup. I do have to admit that I tried this stuff myself, and it sure was good. Except for one thing, all of this, as previously mentioned, was done openly. The only secret was Betty's pregnancy. Had it happened today, she might have kept her child. But in 1953, adoption seemed to be the only acceptable course of action. Nonetheless, there remained a certain amount of mystery about Berkowitz's real family. For Berkowitz, the question was, how did it happen that he was conceived at all? It troubled him. My birth, I, know now, I now know, was either out of spite or accident. Spite as far as Falco tried to get her lover, Joseph Kleinman, to give up his legal wife, divorce her, and marry Betty. She may have deliberately tried to conceive a child, me, in order to pressure Kleinman into marriage commitment. Or I may have just been an accident. Carelessness or failure to use the proper birth controls caused my unwanted conception. Here I was, never wanting to be born in the first place, cursing the day I was born, only to find out that I wasn't supposed to be born after all. Here I was, miserable, unhappy, maladjusted, plagued with death fantasies and suicidal hopes, only to find out that I was unwanted, an accident after all. Here I was, or am, causing all types of destruction and havoc, yet I'm not really supposed to be in this world. My mother, Falco, was sitting in those parked cars with Kleinman, greedy, wild-tempered Kleinman. It was that bastard who I took after, his temper, his impatience, he hated crowds, probably people too. When I finally found Betty Falco, I was told that Joseph Kleinman had died. Not only did he die, but he died a horrid death. He perished from cancer of the rectum. From what my sister and Betty told me, he had quite a painful death. It was also a prolonged one. When I found this out, I no longer had any anger at him. Fate, God, or whatever, had taken its course. He suffered. It settled. For Betty, it wasn't quite settled. He left his money to his legal, frigid wife. Betty got nothing, even though for over twenty years she had fed him, clothed him, copulated with him, and waited on the irresponsible bum. After all these decades together, she shoved everything back in her face. Berkowitz focused obsessively on Betty's parents, especially her father. This man, whom he never met, evoked the same kind of angry responses angry responses he had to certain other people and events in his life his re account of his grandparents death reminds me of the long list of violent incidents he claims to have witnessed during his childhood in the bronx 
I hated him by just looking at his picture. I also had the opportunity to sand over his grave, which was overgrown with weeds. The cemetery was a Jewish one, real small, and in Staten Island. He died by falling down a flight of stairs. He was in his 90s. My grandmother, also in her 90s, died by falling down the same flight of stairs a short while later. Both apparently died of broken necks. Tsk, tsk, tsk. Betty tried to develop her dancing talents, and she wanted to continue dancing and go into show business. Supposedly, she had a lot of talent. However, her strict father, Mr. Broder, who valued tradition over the needs of his children more than anything else, refused to let her fulfill her desires. He insisted that she remain a homebody, get married, raise kids, fix meals, darn stocks, retire to Florida, and eventually die, all according to Jewish tradition. That rotten bastard who considered Betty the apple of his eye, his favorite of all her brothers and sisters, refused to loosen his grip on her. When he finally died and the grip, well, not mentally released, but at least physically released, was loosened, it did Betty no good. By now, she was too old to begin a career, and life had already passed her by. I believe he passed away in the early 70s. Coincidentally, I recall a picture of her and her father alone. The rest of the family wasn't present. Her dad was sitting in a wooden chair with a blank expression while Betty in her dancing costume, stood beside him. She was very young then. Another reason I disliked my natural grandparents, my mother's side, was because of their hatred of my sister, because Barbara was only half Jewish. They completely excluded her from conversations and family activities. How dare these prejudiced scum treat her as an outcast. Meanwhile, she turned out to be the best and most loving of the whole family. If there's a hell, I hope Mom and Pop Broder, my grandparents, are there. One last point. I've been told that the district attorney from Brooklyn once tried to locate Betty and Tony Falco's marriage certificate. Well, I don't know the story and what transpired between my mom and Tony 40 years ago. However, you can, be, you can bet the marriage was held in secret. I know that the Broders, with their traditional values, must have had seizures when they learned my mother had married a Gentile. I don't think my mom married out of love for they, or rather, Tony took off with another woman shortly afterwards. Barbara, my sister, was the black sheep of the family, but her heart is far from black. She's very loving and loyal, a typical Jewish mother. She always puts her family first before herself and would gladly die in one of her daughter's places if it ever came to, down to that. To all appearances, David was sharing the pleasure in his newfound relatives that Betty and Barbara felt in finding him, but when he tried to feel something for them, something deep, he couldn't. The next time he saw them was two weeks to a month after the initial meeting. The final time was in February 1977. He cultivated a deliberate niceness toward all of his new relatives. I seemed kind of lovable, amiable, but I really didn't feel anything for them. Betty Falco doesn't even know me, he later wrote. He confessed that everything about the relationship was phony. The sentiments he had written to his mother, Hello, keep well, take care, I love you, were bull. In fact, he had been really tempted to say the opposite. Berkowitz, for the first time in his life, was dealing directly with the secret source of many of his ambivalent feelings about life. Evidence of how rigidly he sought to maintain his emotional equilibrium was the growing tension between the surface and the darkness below. His feelings about Betty, behind my mask, Richie, the nice guy, I was filled with anger and rage toward her. With absolute control, I managed never to show or verbalize this. He was trying to keep the lid on his volcanic emotions. Discovering that his real mother had not died in childbirth certainly alleviated some guilt and relieved him of the fearful notion that his natural father hated him because the doctors let me live instead of her, but meeting her shattered his primary fantasy of a mystical and perfect family, a blissful family, a perfect relationship. Anger and rage that, in the past, he had been able to control through suppression and creative fantasy now had nowhere to go. His, mytholog his mythologized mother turned out to be just plain Betty Falco. Out of mixed fear and respect for her, he kept quiet, but inside he was boiling. He had seen through her. A closer observation of her personality with reveal will reveal selfishness and excessive worry over what will the neighbors think. When she gave me away, it was for her benefit, not mine. She had kept Barbara and abandoned him. He was given away because he was not good enough. The truth was that he belonged to no family. His myths were expiring all around him. At the time of his release from the army in June 1974, Berkowitz had perceived something disturbing in himself. During that summer, things began to happen to me, and with me. People began to sense something in me. I can't explain it. They were driven from me. Who or what was doing this to him? It was a certain power, force, which chased people away. It was a mysterious force working against me. I felt bothered and tormented. De Schmutz, Yiddish for the dirty one. Then, 
Less than a year later, the already disturbed young man sustained two enormous losses, the loss of his father when Ned and his wife moved to Florida, and the loss of his illusions when he came face to face with his real family. Even Betty, in some way, understood this. The shock of meeting me must have been too much for him, and so the rest happened. In Berkowitz's life, there were now five women, all of whom he feared and hated. His stepmother, Mary, who took his father, Nat, away and left David alone again. Mary's daughter, Carol, his stepsister, who outshone him and upstaged him. His half-sister, Barbara, who was kept while he was thrown away. His adoptive mother, Pearl, who died when he was fourteen, abandoning him. His biological mother, Betty, he would make the world pay for what she had done to him. Meeting Betty was both cruel and crucial. Of all the cruel blows this meeting dealt him, the cruelest was that he now realized he was an accident mistake, never meant to be born, unwanted. There were no rules or guideposts for such a being. There was no forgiveness for such rejection. His hatred toward women was becoming all-consuming, a fireball, and absolute. A poem he wrote titled Mother of Satan was dated September 22, 1976, a month after his first murder. His first murder. Old Mother Hubbard, sitting near the cupboard, with a hand grenade under the oatmeal, who will you kill now, daughter of Satan, in the image of the Virgin Mary, pure and innocent? The great impersonator, is that you? Yes. How many have you deceived? Lured to slaughter like a fat cow. While several thoughts are evoked by this poem, the most potent is the deep hatred he experiences against his natural mother, the mother of Satan, who has deceived him, but he doesn't express his hostility directly to her. It remains instead to be released in brutal and unspeakable fashion. By now, his anger and rage has passed into a new dimension. So, thank you for listening. That was the end of Chapter 4 from Confessions of Son of Sam by David Abrahamson. Um... So, if you liked that, and you thought it was interesting, please tell me below, because I might read chapter 5 for you, if I feel like it, because uh, chapter 5 is when we get into the victims of his crimes, and I think that would be really interesting to read. Um, so I probably will, regardless, but it was very fun <laughs> taking some time out of my day to read that for you guys. And I guess I'll just comment right now, but... Uh, yeah, I thought that was very interesting, especially that last paragraph where they talk about the five women in his life. So all these women in some way have affected him negatively. And when he went out killing, I do believe he killed one man, but he, he killed like six women. He targeted women specifically because he thought of them as something negative. He thought of them as causing the troubles in his life. And even in the chapter before that, I, I mean, I obviously didn't get to talk to you guys about because I decided to read the fourth chapter. But in the third chapter, uh, he talks about his religion a bit while he's in the war. And I think he converted, but he, he, he was so obsessed with the notion of hell. And he was like, you know, I got to save myself and I've got to save all these guys in the military with me. And he was preaching to them, and he was like, you know, you got to stay away from those sluts, which were the sex workers, you know, people who were fucking the soldiers, right? He's like, you got to stay away from those sluts. Who needs women in heaven anyways? If there's too many women in heaven, there, it's not going to be fun. He he had such a disdain for for uh, women. So I guess he, he looked at them as a, a problem, as something he needed to get rid of to, I guess, purify and make the world better maybe. That's that's how I see it. Um, and obviously the Oedipal complex he had with uh, his adoptive mother, Pearl, that also probably plays a big role in there because once, he, once uh, she died, it was abandonment to him and sort of a rejection. And also the rejection he got from his, uh, his natural mother, that's a, reject a rejection to him too. And he wasn't very good with the ladies either, you know? getting into relationships he wasn't good with that either so more rejection so he looks at women as this negative thing that reject him cause all the problems look better than him just nothing good comes out of women to him so i mean let's just say he hadn't been caught he probably would have killed so many more women because uh, they were the main focus of his hatred and uh that's that's all i got to say about that but 
very interesting stuff. I'm very, very happy I decided to read this. Um, so I'll read the next chapter for you guys because it, it is pretty interesting. I know I'm, you know, just pushing this on to you, but I hope you like it. And I'll read some more and maybe give my thoughts at the end. I'm not going to put my thoughts in the middle because oh, that just be a bunch of rambling. But I hope you liked it. I hope you like my <laughs> I hope you like my voice. And that's all. Thanks for listening, and see you next time. Bye.